as DJ. Metal detecting, simplified for newcomers. Exceptional stability in salt water. Waterproof up to 16 feet. Impressive depth and discrimination, similar to a high-end detector. All for an unbeatable price. Score, multi-frequency for all. Many spend their days passively searching for something interesting to do. Others dig in and find it. While nothing is certain, anything is possible. And the anticipation leads you into action. Because it's here that adventures begin. Stories are unearthed, secrets are revealed, fortunes are found, mysteries are solved, and the past is brought to life. Nothing valued is ever lost. It's simply waiting to be discovered. So here's the question. What are you looking for? It's Thursday, it's 8 o'clock, and it's the Big Detecting Show, and somebody's rang in sick. Yes, 
Mr. Badger himself. A little bit poorly. He's got the sickness bug and he won't be with us tonight. But we have a tremendous guest lined up to uh, to chat with tonight anyway. So it'll be just me and him. Because uh, Shane's not well either. Everyone's dropping like flies. What's up with you all? Look at you. I'm here, you. And I'm Mr. Sick. Anyway, before we start the show tonight, uh, I'm going to have a little rant. Now, for those of you who watch the show, you know that we take ourselves very, very, not very seriously. But we try to take the content seriously anyway uh if you were a think back as well when adrian first put on adrian's wall we um we said jokingly and i'm sure every single one of you watched that show and all who know us said ten thousand pound if you get it right first time and it was right first time well suddenly it's come back to bite us on the balls because said person and all his little cronies have come out calling us out where that 10 grand is Anyway, just like to point out that uh, the Big Detecting Show is completely and utterly self-funded by myself, uh, Adrian and Luke. Uh, we make absolutely no profit out of it. We're not a registered business, nor are we a registered charity. So when them questions are being thrown about and asked to friends of mine uh, by this person and his cronies, then... <coughs> We're not a registered charity, nor am I a business. Me and Adrian work, and Luke, all work full-time ourselves. This is done as a hobby in our spare time. And um, honestly, if if I really, really wanted to, I wouldn't do the show because I'm quite happy being lazy and sat on the couch. But I'm enjoying it. enjoy having a crack with me, mate. I enjoy other things. So let's just... I'll cut that off because Shane's had all sorts of phone calls today and uh, it's all said and done. We're not in any way, shape or form making any money out of it. We're doing it for this. And if said person would like to come and see me or face to face, one to one, I'd be more than happy to have that conversation with him. But probably his little shit house and he won't. But the offer is there. Anyway, moving on. Again, just like to remind people, uh, the prizes from the show before Christmas. Uh, basically, the ones that have been sent out, which all of them were provided by other people for the free prize draw and other companies, which we spoke about throughout the show. Uh, all of them that have been sent out from them companies should all be with them for one, which was my fault, which they've been given the details now. And that should be their ASAP. Anything else is under my desk here or in Donna Martin's case over there and hasn't been sent out yet. A, because as Derek Gibbon will, will confirm, I am pap at sending things out. But also being that time of the year and my the business I work for struggling quite badly, I've been left in a hole financially. And unfortunately, I have not been able to sort that out. Plus, when I was in hospital as well so all that's out all that's done hope you're all well uh hope you've all found lots of nice things uh diggers den tezza sent me a message before not got to look at it because i've been in meetings all day tezza so i know it's there and i will have a look but i've not looked yet uh and i also need to speak to nick west i've um messaged adrian and i'm just waiting for his housing manager to confirm what are the dates that we've come up with anyway? So uh, I think that's everything, all the parish notices. I am going to be taking part in a project uh, which I have bought a new metal detector and I've suggested to the company I bought it off, perhaps I can do some day videos, which, as you can imagine, will be complete and utter uh, half-wit's guide to a metal detector to speak about it from me my perspective as lots and lots of people will automatically jump onto youtube and go to no disrespect to sid perry obviously said is a genius at what he does but they'll jump onto sid's videos watch the sid's videos try to copy sid's uh programs and techniques whereas myself if i do it that they're gonna say yeah fair dues 
Dave's I've got a clue. Let's have a look at his perspective. So I've offered to do this, or we've discussed it, and we've we've suggested this as a perspective, as a project that we're going to be uh, doing in the future. So uh, yes, and you're all going to giggle at when you actually see what that um, machine is as well, because it's way above my ability. Anyway, moving on, let's bring on tonight's guest. It's that lovely Mr. Tomlinson. How are you, Steve? Good evening, Mr. Sadler. Very well, you? Thank you. Well, obviously, I know you're in such a high esteem now. It was very difficult to get you on the show because obviously people from all over the world are trying to get you on the telly now. So we're very lucky to have you. <laughs> it's always space for you, mate. <laughs> <laughs> So for those of you uh, people who, who don't know Steve, he joined us just before Christmas. He's joined us previously in the past. Uh, I've got a lot of time for Steve. Well, I love hearing his tales and especially seeing his finds. But Steve, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, well, I'm, I work as a professional archaeologist and also a, a very keen mudlarker as well. So um, a, a bit of both worlds there. Um, a living and a hobby... Stroke living, which is really good. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, love all of it, really. I spend most of my time along with uh, a football, a big Liverpool fan, along with you, Dave. So, sort of like, um, of course, up the Reds at the moment. And, uh, you know, sort of like uh, watching those uh, quite a lot as well, which is uh, which is brilliant. Yeah, so, cool, uh, yeah, great. Yeah, yeah, top. But, uh, yeah. Up to you. Well, and you live in Kent. Yes, I live in Kent. Yeah, live in uh, the Isle of Thanet. So uh, yeah, ah. right down on the east east corner. So now, yeah, the Isle of Thanet thing was it was a complete and utter because uh, Joan Allen were running. I think it was Joan Allen running some metal detecting events there uh, over the last few years, and I'd never heard of the Isle of Thanet. I'm like, where's that? <laughs> I heard of the Isle of Anderson, Anglesey, and the Isle of Wight, and the Isle of Mars. Well, Angle, Isle of Thanet. What's that? Yeah, and, it. and it was only actually looking into it uh, again because I'm sure there's people other than me that don't know. Tell us about the Isle of Thanet and why it's well, the Isle of Thanet. Yeah, do you remember um, Only Fools and Horses? So probably one key episode, uh, the trip to Margate. Yeah, uh, well, I don't live far from there actually, just up the coast from there, but uh, a lot of history, Thanet, actually, over the years, you know, Margate, Ramsgate. Uh, you know, Birchington, well, especially Margate, it's a fantastic history. It's um, kind of like a, a quite a popular destination for holiday people, really, over hundreds of years. It's gone a bit of decline recently, to say the least, with, um, you know, we've got Dreamland there, which has unfortunately um, suffered over recent years, really, at amusement park. Um, but it's getting back on track now. Uh, people always visit, always visit Margate. It's a lovely beach down there. Um, but it's slightly different now to what it used to be. Um, but the coastline in Thanny is lovely. It is very, very nice. And um, it goes right the way through to Westgate, Minnis Bay, through to Birchington, Reculver, where Reculver Towers is. It really is, yeah. It's an yeah, It's like a lot of places. There's run-down areas, but some lovely areas mm. as well. Um, but I think and, and it's actually an isle. As yeah, it is. It's right on the tip, right on the tip of the East Kent coast. Yeah. So right down the bottom on the right hand side, yeah, yeah. Access um, by bridge. Uh, literally straight off to Thanet Way, um, and that takes you into um, sort of Manston, uh, yeah. Manston area uh, where the airport is, um, or hopefully the airport's going to be running within the next five years. But um, yeah, so it's um, it's always been popular with tourists. Yeah, as you can uh, see, I've absolutely no knowledge of the yeah the no. Of the when it comes to history, just looking at the finds that were coming up from the the digs there uh, over the last few years, and it, and it really does look astounding for its history. Anyway, it's amazing, yeah, especially Margate, because I mean, over uh, hundreds of years, um, especially all the shipping, the ships that used to come into the harbour, um, huge history. I mean, the beach is absolutely jam packed, you know, especially during the Victorian days. Mm. Apps, you you couldn't get on the beach, Dave, to be honest. You could you can't well, move. Well, were you there? Uh, well, I may look a bit like you know, uh, <laughs> you know, a couple of more extra grey lines, mate. But <laughs> <laughs> I thought I'd bust them over tonight. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, but yeah, fine, fine, brilliant. Yeah, you know, you know, fashion clay pipes turn up down there, you know, from the 1800s and things and 1700s and even earlier sometimes. But, um, wow. but yeah, quite a few people go beachcombing down there. And, uh, well, the, yeah. the first time we got in contact uh, when you first appeared on the show, you actually found a, a full uh, Roman vessel, didn't you, when you were mudlarking? And yes, I did. Yes, by the media, we we communicated. You came on and told us all about that. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Yeah, yeah. It's um, yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah, to think of um, you know, sort of Roman pot come out of the mud after sort of nineteen hundred years was quite um, yeah, quite amazing, really. Yeah, and, and it but, wasn't small either. No, it's quite a big one. It is sort of you know, sort of second century. So um, yeah, it's been you know, fantastic. It's just you know, find things like that as well. Mm. And, yeah, you know, it's, it's crazy. And, uh, yeah, you know, I've been lucky enough to find seven more since. So it's been quite a nice wow. little, uh, yeah, uh, certain areas, mud larking where, you know, it's luck of the draw on the day, really, isn't it? It's a bit like metal detective where you can go out and, you know, some days, okay, you don't do very well. But to me, it's the, inter it's the enjoyment of doing it. It's not necessarily, you know, making sure you come home with something it's enjoying what you do and you know if you come home with an empty bag you come home with an empty bag you know it's just just the love of it really isn't it mm. yeah so, i mean, mean mudlarking for me i could i get to mudlark to a degree there's there's a small little um well it's a, a special scientific interest place just by me called dane in pasture which is on the river dane ish uh, okay. one of the tributaries to the river dane and it's not it's not a big river this particular place uh you have to walk down the the congleton lines the old rail track uh to get to it but it's absolutely stunning there and and you can see the erosion that's occurring uh and you pick up loads of pottery me little lad loved when he was little going down there just to collect his pot. yeah he's still got a wall full of it so yeah. that's really been my my mudlarking because uh from Ellesmere Port where where I'm from uh the River Mersey uh we couldn't access that because the Manchester ship canal was in the way okay uh where that's somewhere I'd love to go to and, and metal detect there's a an island down the I can't remember what it was called someone will remind me at some point there was, there was an island down the middle obviously between the River Mersey yeah. island yeah. manchester yeah. ship canal love to go on there i've always wanted to go on there because it had all such related to the older uh, abbeys and such like but uh dead man's no that wasn't it anyway um i'd love to have always gone on there but obviously we couldn't get to the river so you couldn't do anything yeah. there yeah. when it come out it was more uh <clears throat> excuse me new brighton yeah so that was yeah. sand i.e the beaches and such like the river day on the other side uh that was weird because you had like thurston and that was all right to get onto but then you had other areas which are all marshland so you couldn't do anything on yeah quite dangerous yeah <coughs> excuse me Sorry. uh so so i've never really been able to in this area but i absolutely love you know to get and do the likes of laura laura maclem and uh, nicola white down at the river uh thames uh, one of the uh, Nicholas fantastic, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. The amount of um, yeah, I love watching her videos. Uh, it's just amazing what she finds. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely Dude, brilliant. Like that would really, really attract me. So uh, exciting, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. you know, whatever you're going to pick up from the River Thames, it ain't going to be. I, I mean, to to them, it's like, oh yeah, it's just another bit of this. But to, to me, it's like, oh, what I found. <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> oh, no. that's, that's the thing. I mean, when, you know, when I first started, started finding, you know, there's sort of all bits of pottery and things. And, you know, I find it so interesting because to me, if you can, if you've got like a name on it, I'm thinking, I don't know that name. I just research it. And I've, I love the research side of it as well, mm -hmm. because, I mean, it's just fascinating, you know, how old is this? Where did this come from? And, um, and things like that. And I mean, it's just, yeah, it's amazing. And I, and I love it. And, um, the thing you know something's been around for you know 100 200 years just just sitting there and all of a sudden you come along you know you find it and uh, you know it's, it's great absolutely great and um i started off as say doing the pottery sign and things and but and uh clay pipes and that um 
venture on onto different different areas and try something different but it's all great i love i love all of it yeah love all of it <clears throat> you talk about the research i mean one of my most recent metal detecting finds which the viewers will know about is a button with a man riding a donkey with a woman alongside him he's got a lot around his head and and you know what i've tried asking uh the library button experts on facebook to, to put it on their group but it just keeps getting rejected okay so inadvertently um somebody else put something on regarding uh greek mythology and it, it put on about Dion the dionysus yeah. rides a donkey and i'm like oh <laughs> i've looked at it now i'm thinking do you know he's got the lot around his head and so but yeah. I've, I've tried researching that, and it's so bloody difficult that particular button. But yeah, have you, have you got much joy now? Are you still struggling with it a little oh, bit? Oh yeah, still struggling. Send still it struggling. over to me, Dave. After I certainly will. Certainly will. Yeah. So I've been doing the archaeological world. Yeah. Uh, I've got a few questions for you already. Okay. Uh, actually, I'll, I'll I'll go up a little bit. Philip Wills says the British Museum are not happy about magnet fishing destroying Viking swords with their strong magnets. Okay. Uh, will uh, Stephen Brain, uh, Quest for Britannia, says, have you found any of the large clay pipes? I'm thinking it means the, you, the you church water type ones. one. Yeah. Yeah. I found one whew, about five years ago now. Mm. And it was after a storm in Margate. And uh, it was just literally sitting there on the rocks. And uh, it was um, it was complete as well. So it was nice. Yeah, really nice church wall. I have actually got it here. I can walk away and I can bring it. I can show you if you wanted to have a look at I, it. I think not just Stephen, but me and many others would appreciate that. Would you like to? Okay, bear with us one second. So we're bearing with him. He's just going to go and get it. He hasn't disappeared. He's, oh, where's he going? He's going, oh, we think he might be going for a poo, actually. So if you obviously, if you do have any questions tonight, uh, help me out by asking any questions with Adrian not here. Nice. And just to uh, let you know as well, for those of you who listen to uh, Relics Radio in the United States, uh, Ken's show, uh, Nick West from uh, Metal Detecting War Relics and the Heritage Military Heritage Museum will be appearing on there tonight. Tune in obviously later otherwise, but it'll be 12.30 uh, a.m. our time that it'll be on there. Let, let me just... Make it bigger. Rub it yeah, and make Mark. it bigger for you. Well, I will do that. Especially oh, look at that. that. Right, that's the church warden's pipe. So, yeah, that is. I found that on the foreshore at Margate Harbour, about, so about five years ago, complete. And I don't know how it survived, to be honest, because they are so flimsy. These, these are absolute, and it's, it's such a large pipe as well um but it did and it was um two days before christmas so it was quite a nice christmas present this is month. it the bore size of it is it is it thin or is it thick yeah it's quite i'll try to move it that way uh yeah it's quite thin actually and it of course it's got this curve yeah as well so that's been sitting well that dates uh it's all about 1800 early 1800s so about 200 years that's been sitting in the um under the seabed I just as and, phenomenal as it is looking at it, the, yeah. the how it's lasted is even just as phenomenal. It has. And it's got um this one's initialed as well, because sometimes you get the initials right on the, the base of the, the hill with the pipe. And um that, yeah, it was dated uh, just after eighteen hundred. And um well apparently from a, a pipe maker in London, so uh, which could ring true because a lot of Londoners come down to uh, Margate. Mm. A lot of Londoners. It's very popular for Londoners, actually. So um, imagine somebody in the 1800s come down with that, probably chucked it off a ship, went down into the uh, seabed, and there I was 200 years later to retrieve it for. <laughs> so when you're watching Lord of the Rings, do you, do you sit there with that in your mouth? Just... Well, it's a bit kind of, you know, when you've got like this... <laughs> <laughs> Has it got, yeah, any, has, has it got <laughs> any teeth marks on it? Only mine now. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's yeah, I'll do it that way. There you go. That's mental. 
Absolutely it is mad. Powerful. And I believe, I believe that the church warden, why it was called church warden's pipe is the fact that it was a, um, this story is true, a grave digger was seen smoking it in a churchyard. And that's where apparently the name originated from, the church warden. Wow. Looks after the grounds. So um, whether that's um, whether that's true or not, but uh, yeah. Let me but, just yeah. Uh, skip. Will Way asks uh, any tips on mud locking? As I've tried in a muddy part of a field on one of my permissions, but as to date I've found nothing. Where am I going wrong? It's probably because you're mud locking in a field and not by the foreshore. <sighs> Why does yeah, that I mean. Happen? <laughs> yeah, I mean, mud, yeah, it's quite a broad term, mud larking, isn't it? Really, I suppose because you can uh, you, you can cover the fields, the streams, the, the foreshore, and I think you know um, fields can be good if you get if you get you know you can find sort of good pottery in fields, um, Roman pottery even in a good area, uh, but obviously you know get permission to do that. You know, obviously that's the key thing, but um, it's almost anywhere anywhere coastal. Yeah, you know, coastal is yeah. always good, as you as you know, probably metal detecting really, really good coastal areas. Um, I've got a damn good question that I don't think I've asked the mudlarker before from um Brian Goodsir Thompson of Monarch Designs. Okay, buy right. your awesome stuff from Monarch Designs. Buy that one. <laughs> he asks, as shotgun caps are the bane of every metal detectorist's life, what is the bane find of a mudlarker? Oh crikey! Wow, Isn't that, oh, a good one? That, that I like that question. Yeah, I do like that. Well, I think all mudlarkers are different. I think some mudlarkers like uh, pottery, some like um, God, you know, clay pipes. Some like collecting um, different different sorts. Really, I, I suppose to that question, I suppose yeah, every, every mudlarker is different. Um, to me, I. You know, I don't mind what I find. You know, some people collect bottles from the foreshore and things like that. So it is a very good question and a really tough question to answer because I think if you relate to the Thames foreshore, where you get such a range of finds anyway, and I mean, you know, most people would pick probably a, a range of a range of anything really they could probably find and, and collect it. Uh, I mean, always seeing if I pick something up I don't like, in the end, end of the day, I'll just sort of bin it when I get home. Mm. Um, but it's yeah, interesting you say about Thames mudlarking as well, because there is, uh, I mean, there's um, some Manchester mudlarkers YouTube channel, there's the Scottish, uh, some Scottish mudlarkers YouTube channel. It's not just Thames for sure. And no, not your, at all. Your, your, no. your finds of national significance have not been made anywhere near the Thames, have they? No. No, well, haven't. not near the Thames. No, sure. no, that's it. No, no, just that. No, outside. Yeah, outside. Yeah, in North Kent. So it's, it's the Thames is very big anyway. It, it, it's miles long, absolute mm. miles. You know, it stretches a long, long way. Um, so you know, different shift patterns of the, the tides will move um, items that move them a long way mm. as well. Something that's dropped into the Thames. Uh, you know, move with the currents, and yeah. it, it can end up almost anywhere. You'll, you'll be surprised where things actually turn up. Uh, amazing. I think there's a story years ago where um, there was a big storm in Faversham, and um, part of a, a shipwreck sort of emerged, and a guy found about 20 Bellamine jugs mm. just around it, and but never been seen. He just went down one day and uh, yeah, and found them. It's an extraordinary date from about you know, 17, well, 1600s, mm. 1500s, but it's extraordinary. Yeah. But um, of course things think, move, yeah. We yeah. know that there the obviously is a tidal river. You don't think that things could move that far, you know, objects that have been there for hundreds, if not thousands for years. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And I think a classic, probably going, uh, going back to probably Margate again in, in the harbour, where there's certain areas where fines will turn up, in certain areas where we can literally completely blank, mm. absolutely blank, is where the, the sand shifts shifts it shifts it across the harbour and it bring it in. But there's other areas where you you'll just get nothing. Yeah, and so I take it, it from yeah. your years of obviously doing that in that area, you can predict more or less what will be a hotspot. Yes, yeah, yeah, pretty pretty much, 
Yeah, pretty much. It takes a little bit of time to get used to it, like anything really, where you go in and you think, oh, which is the good bits and which aren't the good bits. And um, you get to learn it and, and things like that. And I think it's, um, you know, it's, once you've built that knowledge up, then you go out there and you, you hit those places first. Yeah. So is there any sort of of them places that you wouldn't necessarily think nothing ever comes up there that you've been back to and, wow, suddenly there's something that's, they didn't expect that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. <clears throat> I found some nice bottles off Margate, which is an area where he's, you think, well, you know, I've had literally nothing there for, for weeks. Mm. And all of a sudden you'll get two or three lovely bottles come up in, uh, in uh, about three weeks, two or three weeks. Yeah. I mean, I had um, about 16 clay pipes I found within two weeks at Margate, um, yeah. purely because different areas are exposed. Mm. Um, I mean, getting them down there is quite, it's not rare, but you don't get a lot of the pipes complete. And uh, there was an area what um, got shifted. Um, the sand um, uncovered a lot of rocks and a lot of these pipes were just emerging mm. between the rocks. So uh, now, yeah. Angie's asked about your going back to your pipe, um, and I think Donna Martin's actually um, answered the question. She asked why such the long um, stem. Donna yeah. Martin says because the tobacco was rough and it cooled the smoke. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, because tobacco is well, especially when clay pipes came out, which was about fifteen eighty. Um, tobacco was very expensive so they made the really small bowls mm -hmm. a really really tiny bowls and so you could get a little bit so basically the tobacco went further um as gradually the years went on that the bowls actually got a lot larger tobacco came cheaper so then you could put more tobacco in i mean these clay pipes probably cost about a penny in their day wow. <laughs> so literally why they're so broken most of the time is people used to snap them in half get rid of them just buy another one yeah yeah, so um, uh, she also said shag. So sorry, she said I avoided saying shag. Well done, <laughs> Donna, for avoiding saying that. Uh, <laughs> Brian Goodsey Thompson says, and he is Scottish, so he's allowed to say this. Scottish mudlark and he's just a daily bath, bath isn't it? <laughs> yeah. They do well up there. There's a guy who comes on my site who um, bolt digs up there. Mm. That's quite a lot of bolt digging. He does, uh, seems to do really well. Yeah, he's, um, I've seen Something. the. Yeah. Something I'd love to do that, but uh, Chris Langston never seems to invite me. No, no, no. <laughs> he may do tonight. <laughs> uh, was, I've seen something else there. Andy Kerridge. Uh, now, obviously, on the Thames foreshore, there, there is rules for excavation and such like. You, yes. you, know, you can't necessarily do that. So he asks, how deep are your finds or most of the finds that you're finding? I don't dig on the foreshore at mm. all. So mine are literally eyes only. Um, yeah, yeah, literally sort of even coming out of the mud, shallow mud, um, most of the time. Yeah, so it's just walking along the foreshore and just seeing what I can find. I, I've never dug for anything um, like that. Um, if there's something, well, I say dug, dug, but you might you get your trail in and you scoop out a bit of mud, but not physically with... Try, uh, you know sort of spades or anything like that i've never done that before mm. um so yeah that's sort of eyes only and, and matthew j kent asked another good question obviously we we've got the increase in metal detectorists via yeah. certain tv programs and such like and, and news articles that have led to people involvement yeah what's it like with mudlarking now it's been an increase of that that you've noticed yeah they have they stopped the permits in london now um because there's so many um they can't physically stop you going on the foreshore but you're not allowed to pick up w without permits so you can't literally bag stuff up like permit holders would um but literally there's, there's a lot of places you can still sort of generally walk a lot of pub still walk on the foreshore yeah um, a lot of places but you know without licenses you, you physically can't do it yeah, mm. you, you, you just can't mud luck um so uh but it massive increase i think it's really taken off and i think it, you know probably going back five six years ago there's probably 50 percent less people doing it and it's mad isn't it because yeah all right youtube has has helped that and obviously social media groups has helped that but 
there was a TV program 10 years ago with Suggs introducing it, which was, you know, full on mudlocking and that's right. That, that sort of increase didn't occur. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think people um, probably going back about 10 years ago were, were interested, but never really did it. Mm. You had the usual people doing it, but then people started saying, OK, I think I'll have a go at this. It's, it's really interesting and go out there and see what I can find. And I think there's, there's so much now, which is really, really, it really has taken off. Yeah, really taken off big time. And um, um, I, I, I think if you, you know, you, you kind of stick with the rules, do what you're meant to do, stay safe. I think that's a big thing, really, when you're mudlarking. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people say to me, you know, how do I mudlark? I think the biggest key is really to, if you're going out in the foreshore, you, um, if you're allowed to go on the foreshore in the first place where you're going, is just stay safe. I mean, because that mud um, may look nice to go on to, but there's deep pockets of mud where you can quite easily go down into. And yeah. it's quite dangerous. So, you you know, carry a mobile phone. Um, always carry a mobile phone because you're going to be out there always take someone with you as well i think that's a, you know that's sometimes a, um a, you know a key thing to do really as well because you don't want to be stranded in the mud you know if the sea's sort of half hour or hour away from coming in and you're in trouble you know that's um it's not good and i bet you've got an app or a website saved on your phone with all the tidal times haven't you yeah <laughs> Yeah, I have. I've lost me welly before. I mean, <laughs> I mean, it's sort of like it's it's quite weird because you, you go down into the mud, and you sort of like you go down quite deep. You sort of like because you've got um, Wellington boots are quite open at the top, so the air goes into the Wellington boot, and of course you're trying to struggle to like you know you you your welly's going down and you're trying to get your foot out but it won't let you so you, it's a bit of a um yeah it can be a bit a bit dangerous at times but generally know your know your area know where you can go don't, don't be stupid don't go miles out because you know you may you know you may not come back yeah so because it is dangerous it can it can be dangerous yeah i mean we've seen um sci finds he's got other craft and he's going all over them mud flats but you know, so you wouldn't touch them on your your normal feet, would you? No, it's all right if you don't break down. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but no, I mean, you know, he's sensible that you know he would take all the safety precautions anyway. You know, he would he would just go out in a little craft without necessary equipment. To, mm. You know, if you do get in trouble, you know, because uh, you'd be mad to do that. So uh, yeah, and you've got a um, a buddy who goes along with you. I mean, you introduced her by name the last time you were on the show. Yeah, Emily's um, come along a few times as well. So um, yeah, she really enjoys it. Yeah, yeah, and she was there with the um, she was there that day with the bronze age shoe uh, came out, and uh, she was there um, on this day when the other piece came out, which I'll talk about shortly. Brilliant. So, yeah, she she enjoys it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, we got obviously a few more bits and bobs coming through on the chat. Uh, Stephen Braham again asks, "What are the oldest coins you've found, or have you actually found anything gold?" Strangely enough, I've never found a coin on the foreshore. Wow. <laughs> I have in my job. I found a Roman hoard in my uh, job as an archaeologist, but I've never, as a mudlarker, found any coins. Never, never, no. Nope. No. How mental is that? You've actually found a, a bloody a hoard. That's yeah. You know, how many people in here would give the left arm to find even a sniff of a hoard, and you found one doing your job? Yeah, doing my job. <laughs> yeah, 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 but, yeah. But never on the full shore. Yeah, yeah, done it my job, but um, yeah, never, never in my job. So um, yeah. Uh, but Brian Goodsir Thompson says something that I'm sure we'll we'll get into a little bit later on regarding this year. He says, uh. The mud and silt play a part in preservation, not just in terms of organic matter like leather mm. shoes, but keeping things from moving and getting damaged like the clay pipe. Uh, do you know a popular creator called Tales from the Foreshore? No, I don't. No. Uh, Steve, are you always happy to find a large pipe? Easy now, Tiger. <laughs> I can do another one. 
Uh, scroll down a little bit. I'm catching up now. Mudman, that's what that program was called. Oh, yes, yes. yes. Uh, do we know when they're going to allow any more permits? Absolutely not a clue. Not Johnny so Vaughan. Well, it wasn't yeah. Suggs. It was Johnny Vaughan. Bloody Johnny Suggs Vaughan. was the... Uh, He's done the uh, RAF stuff, didn't yeah, he? Yeah, the um, RAF one, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, what is the strangest thing that you found on the foreshore? Straight away in my head, I can imagine what it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, it depends if you could call it a mudlarking find or not. I found a, I found a packet of pants, uh, modern pants, uh, a few years ago, which were kind of like they're out the packet but lined up on the foreshore. Uh, which was and, and of all the people who would have loved no. to carry on that conversation, <laughs> yeah. he's tonight on the sick. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I'd bring it up now, otherwise, he might get involved a little bit in this one, mightn't he? But, um, yeah, well, it, that's the strangest, yeah, I, I suppose, it, in that sense. I don't know what that was about or who had done it, but there was five pants and they were kind of like all in a row. So I really don't know, but that's the, uh, the weirdest. Probably um, the strangest find was probably um, a porcelain doll um, with sort of like two legs off and one arm off, but one arm remaining with the head, which was a little bit weird. And someone had sort of drawn on the doll to make it really, really creepy. So that was quite a, yeah, and that's quite a weird one, actually. Yeah. I didn't bring it home. I kind of left it there. I thought it might be a bit kind of cursed or something. So I, didn't pick I, it I actually like the, <laughs> the pants bit more, more fun. Yeah. <laughs> I was yeah, thinking so about some form of, I don't know, suggestive phallic instrument. I, yeah, I no, I don't know if... I don't know if there was a string attached. It was some kind of flag, weird flag or not. I, I really don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it might I didn't investigate them, Dave. I just left them. It might have been a rest area for some doggers, and it was like, it take been, these yeah. if you need them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Been great coming home with that one, wasn't it? Five pairs of pants. Yeah. <laughs> Off you found tonight, my love. Five yeah, pounds. Yeah. You can't wash for me. <laughs> they weren't even my size either, so they're completely useless all round, to be honest. Uh, so, you, you, your job, your profession is that of an archaeologist. And, and basically, we've spoken in the past, you've mentioned it before, you're being a, a, a mudlarker, that, that's led into a profession, hasn't it? Yes, I think it has, really. Yes, yeah. I think, really. I think being an archaeologist really, really helps about what you kind of find as well. It gives you some, well, probably the leather items as well that I found probably, yeah, being an archaeologist, you know, I, I may have been one of, you know, a few people who may have just walked over it, you know, not probably taken much notice. But, um, yeah, it, it certainly helps, yeah, definitely. And I think the mud darking well for me is certainly, yeah, it's kind of taken off, really. It's... Um, but, it, you know, it's, I think when you find, two, you know, two special items, I think, you know, to find one is nice. I think to find two is quite extraordinary, really. And, um, yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it, you know, the, it's gone down such an exciting path, I think, really, because it's just complete shock, really, what they turned out to be. You know, I never in my wildest dreams ever thought that, um they are what they are and um yeah it's extraordinary and, and i think that's the fantastic side of mudlark and any anybody can find something really good um any, you know there's a lot of mudlarkers out there and everybody has a chance and this was i suppose my day or my two days really but never expected it probably never happen ever again but um very very unexpected yeah yeah and let's uh let's bring on these bits and bobs shall we so right. I've got them in a uh, in the which way am I going here? So that's the first image that you've sent me. Okay, right. Is, is there a larger one? There might be a larger with the complete leather. Right. If you go to uh, that uh, one on top row, top right, that one. Right, that's it. Right, okay. 
like so, that. So just for a bit of context, uh, we just recently had the, the latest series of Digging for Britain uh, on the BBC. And uh, obviously, episode five, uh, you made an appearance of it by magic. <laughs> I did. Yes, yes, yeah. And, and it was to discuss this shoe that you found uh, down on Mudlarking, yes. which turned out to be, I'll leave that to you. Yeah, right. Yeah, the, the shoe, well, yeah, the shoe itself was um, extraordinary, really, because it was just off the mud, muddy area of the foreshore. And um, when I first found it, I, I thought it was kind of medieval. Um, do you want to bring, is that shoe up there, Dave? Do you want to bring that shoe? Sorry, to uh, yeah, that bottom left picture with what? the orange. Yeah, that's the one. Okay, right. That's the actual shoe itself. So that was a laying upside down, um, just on the edge of the mud on the foreshore. And when I looked at it, I thought this, you know, it got an inkling this is really good. But I actually thought it was medieval. I actually thought it was um, some kind of medieval kind of turn shoe. Um, but I didn't think it was good e either way. So I took it home and um, sent a bit off to be carbon dated um, in Scotland. And the carbon dating result came back four weeks later with a date of 888 to 781 BC. So I was standing in my living room with a cup of tea in my hand, which nearly went all over the carpet at the time. <laughs> because... Um, it worked out 2,910 to 2,803 years old. So at that point of the carbon dating result, it was the oldest shoe found in the British Isles. Mm -hmm. So the gentleman said to me, he said, this is extremely rare. Do you want it carbon dated again? And I went, yes, please. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll do it again just to make sure. Um, so he carbon dated again uh, four weeks later. Just after Christmas, it came back with exactly the same result. They said, this is what it is. Um, it's um, it, So it turned out officially to be the oldest British shoe found in the British Isles, which is in the late Bronze Age period. Um, and today, of, today, as far as we know, it's the smallest Bronze Age shoe ever found in the world. Wow. Um, it measures 15, roughly 15 centimetres. Uh, which is a toddler's shoe, roughly about the age of probably nine months to three years. Uh, Bronze Age people were slightly different in size them days to what we are now, so they're a little bit smaller, so we have to go on the sizing of what we think the modern-day sizes in were to the modern-day sizes of today. Um, so, yeah, we we kept I kept it quiet for five months before the news was released on this. You kept, on... hint, you kept hinting to me. You I know. Tell me, but you kept hinting. I know. I did. I did. Yeah, I did. And I said, "Yeah, there's something special coming." I think, and uh, yeah, yeah, it was yeah five months of keeping quiet because we got other professionals involved in this as well. Uh, we had um, a, a conservator. We had someone do the X-ray scans of the shoe. Uh, it went up to the British Museum, and we had to make sure that it was what it was. So, and that took quite a bit of time, um, say about five months. And then once it was pretty much confirmed as um, the smallest shoe in the British Isles, not in the world at that time, um, it got released. Yeah. And then it was, uh, it went quite crazy after that um so yeah yeah amazing just amazing just off the full show really and this uh, is what you initially is this what you spoke about on digging for britain it was yes yeah alice um it took it up um Francis roberts to um have a look at and and, and see them there is another picture there dave can i just go back to the big screen um sure. because i'll show you something on that as well that one next to it on the right hand side, that big that picture, one? that's it. That's one. Yeah, we took it to show Alice. Um, Dana Goodburn Brown was there as well. She's one of the conservators um, who looks at the shoe as well. And we also had um, Jess come up as well, <clears throat> excuse me, and she'd done the reconstructions of the shoe. 
was absolutely fabulous because she's a professional leather worker so we had a leather worker involved to see um if this could be reconstructed which is very very difficult because we don't it's so limited information on bonsai shoes it's such such limited so um, along with the British Museum, we had to look over this to see where the, the, the stitching holes were, how it was formed, put together, um, and she'd done, a, she'd done a cracking job. Now, this picture here, um, at the top there, there's, there's a pattern uh, just on the underneath. Um, in Must Farm in Cambridgeshire, they had a woven material which was very, very similar to this pattern um which dated again around about three thousand years old um but, but that wasn't leather that was just a woven material um so yeah yeah no absolutely um absolutely incredible so it went up to digging for britain and um they, they showed it showed it on there um and i think dave there are another two pictures of the reconstructions of the shoes i think i've seen you yeah so two black shoe things yep that's one of them uh, we had four reconstructions done um mm -hmm. but the last meeting with the british museum um pretty certain that this is one of the styles that looks more promising it's, it's kind of like a slipping um type of shoe um, with the laces we're going down the side and probably a, a quite a tight yeah that that's what they call like a cornish pasty style that was quite known in the bronze age um quite an easy slip on and you had the the laces sort of going through the side there um and slightly turned up at the front um so they're the two styles that we're pretty certain would have been to that original shoe fascinating yeah yeah so um yeah and that was another yeah and uh, th this was the second one um on the foreshore with with emily that day um the tide was coming in and i just saw this on the edge of the foreshore and it it was strange because it, it, the leather was poking out the mud but not too far but i managed mm -hmm. to rescue it quick and it just looked so much different uh, really really soft leather very soft leather which is very unusual really unusual from the foreshore um so again i had an inkling that this was this could turn out to be quite good um again went up for carbon dating in scotland and this time i, I basically did drop the cup of tea on the floor <laughs> It came back with a carbon dating result after four weeks of 2578 to 2466 BC. So that is 4,600 to 4,488 years old. So you broke your own record. So I broke my own record. And as far as we know to date, uh, it's the only piece of nearly hit leather ever found in the British Isles. Wow um which is extraordinary and it dates stonehenge yeah. this piece of leather dates stonehenge so uh, you know I, I just it you know really hasn't sunk in even i found that in march 2023 and it really hasn't sunk in to be honest about um but it's a very special one as well because it looks like um it's been coated in um, some kind of waterproofing material. Okay. Um, the British Museum think it's either could be part of a bag or third part of a water bottle, which would make sense for a waterproofing agent to be on that leather. Yeah. Um, the yellow, the yellow stroke orange brown could be, um, it's not confirmed, but it has been looked under a microscope by two or three professionals. Um, and it will be looked at further, could be at this stage um, a beeswax. Right. Which is very popular in the late Neolith in the Neolithic period. Um, but that is still ongoing at the moment, and it's, it's not confirmed at the moment, but it, it, it looks quite promising. Um, this one here is a red staining going on here. 
uh, which could be, there's some various things it could be it could be ochre which mm. is a red kind of material they used to use as well um, again that's going under further investigation uh, but we do we do know that this pr well pretty 100 percent so this is a waterproofing agent which is on here um which would make sense to um, being a water perhaps a water bottle we ha it is inside and outside uh, in in patches so it's very 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 exciting now um, obviously both of the artifacts are have been or are, are being uh preserved how is that being done yeah that's being preserved at the moment by a professional conservator um literally it's uh making sure it's in uh, bottled water not whole bottle just make sure it's damp at all times so it keeps it fresh um, um tap water would destroy it because it's got too many chemicals in it so it's bottled water um put it in the fridge they put it in the fridge and just to keep it fresh mm. um Wherever it goes, we've got very, very promising at the moment. We've had really, really exciting meetings with the British Museum. Very exciting. Um, I've got another meeting coming up shortly to discuss the future. Um, wherever it goes, it will need permanent preservation. So they will um, do whatever testing they need on that um, to do. Um, get every bit of knowledge they need out of that of what the waterproofing agent is um, and everything they, that they need to know and then they can um, put it in whoever has it in permanent preservation so it won't deteriorate um, and then it will hopefully go online so people can research it and they can look into it and do their own um, yeah and just learn about it but it, it's incredible because it, it, it's two items that just do not survive unless they're in anaerobic conditions away from the air so um it's it's extraordinary and uh, you know things like this you know it's so incredibly rare you know on a local national and uh, it's turned out on a world scale really um you know it's um but it's for everybody to enjoy you know everybody um be lovely for everybody to to see it one day what museum it ends up in just to just to have a look and say, wow, you know, this, this is what it is. And uh, that, you know, that, uh, and that's special. Yeah, that's very special. And it just goes to show how important that foreshore mud actually is for preserving history. Definitely, definitely, yeah, because that would never survive uh, in the field. It would just deteriorate hundreds of years ago. Um, it's only really that mud, that clay mud, which has preserved that so well, I mean, it's it's a part bag. The rest of it's gone. It's you know never probably expected to to find that little bit really, but um, it's preserved it so well that um, a little bit of bag which is left has, has told its story within itself. Mm. And um, yeah, to to think you know it, it dates the the reconstruction of the circle at Stonehenge um, and when the um, the pyramids were built as well in in Gaza. So. So, I mean, so, obviously, Stonehenge makes you think old, but when you say same age as the pyramids, then yeah, bloody old in your head, isn't it? Yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah, 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 it's um, it, it's amazing, and, and you know, once we learn a bit more about that as well, we hopefully get some more reconstructions of that one as well. So, um, yeah, just uh, yeah, just incredible, really. Mm. Ange asks, uh, is, uh, obviously at this point, I don't think tests would be able to say anything, but would you be able to tell what animal the leathers actually come from? Yes. Yes, you would. Yes. And, yeah, and that, that's that going to come further down the line. Yeah, that will come further down the line. I think when, it, I think when the official handover goes to where it's going to go to, um, testing will, will be done, hopefully, to what animal it's come from. Um, the say the um the waterproofing agents what they may be they could could even be brain matter they used to have brain matter years ago uh, which they used to use for waterproofing so that could be a possibility uh but yeah all the tests can, once can we can we done. still do that today by any chance? well we could try <laughs> probably a few people love to do it too to be honest 
<laughs> yeah, but so, yeah, yeah it's, a, it's amazing. Yeah, yeah. But so yes, the the the, the original shoe that you found has that test been concluded on that yet to find out what animal that's come from? No, no. They were looking to do um, some kind of DNA on that shoe, but it's mm. very, very difficult. They were going to look, um, British Museum were going to look to see if it, there's any skin cells left, see where they come from, a boy or a girl. But it's extremely difficult because you literally have to dry that leather out to near enough dry, literally yeah. a hard stage. And it's too risky, I think, to perhaps go down that route. Um, I think... Um, so possibly, I think there's Prometrics, which is very similar to DNA, which is another route around it. But once again, it is, it's a bit of a risk, really. So it, it, that may not be done. But um, they certainly look at the layers of the shoe, which looks like there's um, definitely two layers, possibly a third, but we're not sure. We think the third may have split. So, it, yeah, so we, we definitely got the two, which is typical of, of a shoe anyway. Um, well, at the moment, is some people want it to be mammoth and some people want it to be human. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, we we do have some weirdos. What's the show? I'm not saying you're weird or anything, Donna. By the way, well, mammoth one will come. That'd be nice, actually. And yeah. we mammoth show, yeah, that'd be pretty quite warm as well. So, yeah, so, who knows? Back to archaeology. Uh, yeah, and as an archaeological archaeologist. Archaeologist or an archaeologist in the field. Um, yeah. what, what have you been up to there this past year? What project are you currently working on? Um, I'm working on a we've got quite an exciting site at the moment. We're um working on a prehistoric site. Um, I'm working currently on some SFBs, which is it's a sunken featured building, which is basically something that um went from prehistoric days. Um, right through to um, sort of 13th century, really. Mm -hmm. But we're finding, yeah, it's a nice little site. We've got some nice pottery out. It's a nice Roman, uh, late Belgic pottery. Um, some, um, yeah, general bits of loads and loads and loads of oyster shells and food that they ate in them days, as they did. Absolutely hundreds of them. Um, so, so that's what we went back really early. Nice. That's the bane of the archaeologists on this. Well, site. yeah, I mean... <laughs> I mean, it's quite, I think at first, I think when I first started quite a few years ago, seeing about 100 oyster shells dating 2,000 years was quite exciting. But I think once you start kneeling on them and they hurt your kneecaps <laughs> and they're everywhere, then it gets Ancient a bit man's harder. Lego. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. And you come home with cuts on your knees. Um, yeah, but it's still really exciting. I, I, I enjoy it. And I think, you know, we found some like loom weights, what they use in the Iron Age, uh, do where tapestry and all that and on their clothing and so that that's exciting and um you know um these sort of sfbs they're, they're, they're quite good because they can all it kind of like waste pits in a way where it, they just throw almost anything in there yeah so you can end up with um, pin beaters you know loom weights almost anything and uh, we've had some nice stuff same and where we've had which has been lovely coming out so it's been good yeah yeah. Tell us about the, the hood then, because um, that must have been a phenomenal yeah. discovery itself. Well, a hoard, a hoard actually is not actually that many coins. Yeah, yeah. It's only, as you well know, it's only probably about seven. Um, so this one, I think, produced about 20. It was only about 20. It wasn't massive. It wasn't massive, massive hoard. It was about 29 um, Roman coins dating uh, literally the early first century to, to the fourth. Uh, and they were just sprawled in a big pit, uh, literally um, within pottery. And um, yeah, so that was really nice. It's a lot, certainly the largest I've ever found. I've never mm. found as many as that ever before. So that was um, a couple of years ago. That, that, that was nice. Yeah. I take it. So that particular site, we're not going to talk about site names or locations, but that yeah. particular site, what had led the, um, the the team to actually identify that as a, a location worthy of an archaeological dig? Well, I think at first, before any building planning goes in, it has to be in an archaeological area. Right. Um, 
if you're not in an archaeological area, you don't generally need any kind of planning permission. But if you are in an archaeological area, and most of Fanny is because it's known as the Isle of the Dead anyway, it's Fanny is renowned as the best archaeological place in the country. Mm -hmm. um, so Jimmy, a lot of it does lie in it, and uh, this site did as well, and it was it was really good, very very rich in in finds. Um, I had a um, well, it, it, there was a Roman pit, and there was five pieces. It looked like some kind of dagger or something mm -hmm. in it, but it was it was broken in five pieces, and um, it's um, hopefully being looked at because they found one in germany about two years ago and this is exactly the same design as that one it's all encrusted in all the iron and everything staining turned out to be a silver dagger roman silver dagger and this one there has got exactly the same shape wow so i'm hoping um and that took nine months to um in preservation do you know what i'm pretty sure i've shared a silver german roman dagger on the archaeology and metal detecting magazine that could be the one week. yeah because yeah. that 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 is very interesting if it's i'm just going to have to pull that up and have a uh will it show me or is it something in fact it might be in me uh i've got a photo, photo so i'll just send it to you on uh, messenger dave at some point just seeing if i've binned it i think a young lad found it i think in germany no oh, can't find it now I'm pretty sure they have shared one this past week or so. Is it in that one? I remember seeing one anyway, but uh, nonetheless, um, if it is the same one, wow, again. It's got the it's same so shape. so lucky. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well, it's got to stop eventually, Dave, I mean, isn't it? <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Uh, Diggers Dan Terry, he said the field he's been doing uh, – and the field that he's on and now under the archaeologist as well and in five months the houses are going up there yeah. so obviously an archaeological order on that yes yeah 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 it's um it's always it's always a tough one isn't it because you know we don't like to see a history go um but unfortunately this day and age you know with the housing as it is and it's it's one of those that, um, yeah, you, you needs to be there. I, I think it's more difficult on burial sites. I think when you've got, um, I think the classic one we did probably a couple of years ago was the uh, burial site in Deal in Kent. Mm -hmm. And we had about 96 Anglo Saxon burials. And uh, people say, you're telling me all about that, yeah. Yeah, why are you removing them? Well, the problem is the foundations of the buildings will go through those skeletons and they'll smash them all up anyway. They'll just literally be absolutely smashed. So, you, you know, you, you take them out they um, and they do get reburied. They, they do get reburied. But it's, it's always in it because people say, oh, why can't you just leave them there? Well, we leave them there. The bulldozers are going to literally rip them to shreds. Or and if somebody places. does a bit of the home gardening 10 years yeah. later and they found a body under the ground, it all stops for tea again. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah, <laughs> so it's always, you know, it's yeah, yeah, it's always, you know, so it's, when you say the reburied again, we're not going to discuss any, but yeah. how how's that come about? Did he take it to a recognised cemetery, or how, yeah. uh, where would they bury them again? Normally, extremely close to the site they were original, originally at, uh, which is normally most most cases, uh, most cases, but uh, being. How many burials did you say? 96? About 96. Yeah, yeah. 96 burials obviously being removed and then reburied in a local churchyard, then you're going to be struggling for yeah. the room there. You'll be in a churchyard, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Without the headstones as well, yeah. <laughs> Just be opening old ones up, stick a Yeah, I know, oh, yeah. Like what a femur yeah. in that one. But that HS2, wasn't it? They had all the uh, Victorian ones, didn't they? And the... Uh, at about 800, wasn't it, or something? Was it they had there? Was it? Yes. Was it? Yes, wasn't it? So. Yeah. Yeah. I remember, the, I remember the Victorian ones with loads of burials anyway. Yeah. And what about so. when they were digging through, um, weren't they digging through layers in London to do the new tunnel system down there? And yeah. And they dug through some form of um, burial site. 
Yeah, yeah. No, that could be the one actually, to be honest. But yeah, I mean, low, actually hundreds of them, hundreds. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Matthew Kent's just sent me some pictures. He said, uh, actually, I'll go, it'll go on to Facebook. Obviously, it'll be on there. Uh, that was the one. We just present that for you. Is that the fella? That's the fella. That's the one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that one was in, uh, yeah, that's the one, the young lad. Yeah, preservation. That was encrusted in all orange, iron staining yeah. and usual what you get underground. Um, I think that was in preservation for nine months. It turned out to be a silver Roman dagger. Yeah. This one. Well, lovely young man, but the um, yeah. not very pleased with the ponytail on that chapel. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's the one. Well done to that gentleman who's done that. Yeah, that's that's, that's it. Yeah. And, um, yeah, so, so the one. one obviously, a similar shape to what you. you extremely you similar. Design. Very, very, very similar. Yeah. Yeah. It was in a Roman pit as well. So very, very, uh, we'll see, hopefully, what comes of that one. Yeah, hopefully. Uh, Philip Wills said, yes, it was cross rail, the Elizabeth line. Yeah, yeah, Elizabeth line. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, wow. God. Crazy, isn't it? Yeah, it's out there, there isn't it? <laughs> Here's one for you. Uh Oh, it's a candle. I thought it was real. John Clayton's fine today. Two quid at a charity shop. I thought it was real. It's a candle. No, I <laughs> I'll tell you, charity shops are quite good for finding some of them, aren't they? Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think that would fight the life out of me if I saw that in my pit. <laughs> it's quite creepy, actually, isn't it? Men, I want one. That's nice. I actually like it. It's creepy, but I like it. <laughs> yeah, We're gonna have good. to make a, a mold now, aren't we? Get an oh, actual yeah, yeah, we are. make a mold yeah, yeah, and then uh, yeah. pour some of the other in it. It's really cool, actually. <laughs> uh, HST workers exhume three thousand bodies in Buckinghamshire, Buckinghamshire churchyard, says Nick West. God, God I knew Mental, that. Isn't it? Yeah, that's crazy, isn't it? Yeah, that is crazy. You yeah. know, when, when in, in the respects of that, all right, the one that was found by yourselves, you didn't necessarily know it was there. So, you know, no, getting that to be re put somebody else, you, you can understand it, but removing 3,000 bodies from a churchyard oh, just to make way for God, a bloody. Dear. Railway that's not getting built above crew anymore. Yeah, I know. Anymore. yeah, 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 yeah. It's, God, it's terrible, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, Adrian's not with us tonight, John. He's got a uh, sickness bug, so he's uh, been made to stay in bed by his housing manager. <laughs> and Shane was going to join us, uh, sent in the link, but unfortunately, Shane's uh, microphone wouldn't work. I know Shane's got a new computer. Oh, there, yeah, there's a picture of the... Um, what's it called? The dagger with the encrustation. Ah. Thanks again, Matthew. That's the one. Yep. Yeah, well done. Yeah, that's it. Yep. So literally, very, yeah, literally, same as that, but in five pieces. Mm. So it's a bit unusual for silver because silver. So I'm not not sure whether that is going to turn out to be uh, silver. It would have been quite a quite. And a it bright. took nine months to re, uh, to get it back to. That's right. That state. That, that state. Yeah. Well worth it, wasn't it? Absolutely. E extraordinary, isn't it? Absolutely extraordinary. Yeah. Oh, to find something as prominent it as that. Yeah, God, yeah. yeah I'm going to have to come and actually one. meet you in the flesh, Steve, just so I can touch you to get some of your amazing fine scent from you. <laughs> well, we'll we'll we have one day, Dave, aren't we? We have yeah. indeed. <laughs> we'll have to one day, mate. We'll have to sort that one out. Absolutely. Definitely. Uh, definitely. Talking of, of meeting up, uh, I did also give say I'd give mention to a, uh, a 
another metal detecting event that has been announced while it's in my head. Uh, the Festival of History uh, takes black place the 19th to the 22nd of September near Camborne in Cambridgeshire. A uh, thousand acre historic site, four days detecting with camping, live entertainment, bars and catering. All proceeds in the raffle there going towards combat stress and kids at Christmas. If you're interested in finding out more about the Festival of History Rally in September of this year, look for their Facebook group, Digging History UK. Because uh, mm. I know there's quite a few people who are actually interested in that. Uh, and it happens at the same time, I think, as Detectomania, which is the... Um, Scottish rally organised by Gary Robertson. Uh, so at least that weekend you have a choice. And I'm off yeah. the following week. <laughs> Even better. <laughs> uh, Paul Song said it's a good group, that one. Last year was a very good event. And Matthew J. Kent said that's not very far from him. Good, good, good. Yeah. So what's next? You obviously... Back to work, is it a Monday to Friday job? It's a Monday to Friday, yeah. And is it yeah. a weather permitting job or rain or shine you do? What it's, you do? Yeah, it's, it's a bit of everything, Dave, yeah. Bit of rain, sun. It's been really poor weather, probably like most of England, to be honest, and the British Isles. I think we've had a pretty rough time, haven't we? Mm -hmm. And um, I think about six sunny days in the last couple of months so it's getting a bit tedious now to be honest i just want a nice spell of sunny weather yeah because i mean you get the heavy rain it floods it and it's awful to work in it really yeah. is it, it's sloppy man you actually destroy the archaeology to be honest rather than uh, doing your favors so if it really rains hard it is it's pointless it's pointless so um we are quite on a good drain drain in sight though at the moment so it's not too easy does drain pretty quick but even so the heavy rain does destroy a lot of features mm. um so you do more damage and good in that sense but and I, I appreciate that but there's been like the floods uh 2016 maybe mm. um across lincolnshire in that area they were actually showing up some absolutely phenomenal archaeological sites that nobody knew were there it, it does, uh, yeah, it does. absolutely, yeah, yeah. And that, that's the thing. Actually, the rain, I, I, you get the rain in the good light, it shows up really good features, mm. and that is really positive because the bright sunshine can be a nightmare in that sense. So you're sort of like, it's lovely to, to be in, but, uh, I mean, I don't like it too hot out there anyway. It's in the 80s, I, I hate it. You know, it's too hot. It's horrible you know, for archaeology, because it bakes the ground, it's really, you know, you can't see much, much of the features. But as you rightly say, when it rains, and you get really good light, it really uncovers them. Yeah. And it's, yeah, lovely, and it's great, and, you know, not too much every rain, but just enough. Yeah. <laughs> and then, obviously, your weekends, family time, bit of mudlarking here and there, when you're next out, Oh, over the ground. Well, I'm due a visit somewhere, so I'll be out, yeah, probably within the next couple of weeks, I think, to be honest. I think I've got Christmas out of the way with the family, so um, I think, yeah. Yeah, had, you've had enough of them now. You want to, your you time. Yeah, they, well, you know, there's only a certain amount of presents you can do. <laughs> so, <laughs> you can give out and whatever. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, yeah, it's just a bit of chill time now. Yeah, there's there's a record to break, isn't there? Yeah, I'm not sure I'm going to do it, though, Dave, to be I don't know. I don't know. You've done well so far. Yeah, yeah. We're sort of like, um, well, we say you never know. As you say, you never know. It's a bit like, you know, metal detecting, isn't it? It's out there. Yeah. It's out there. It's just got to be discovered, mate, isn't it? Absolutely. You know, and anyone can do it. And if you do do it, you know, you know, good luck to anyone, absolutely anyone in the field, whoever, whoever finds that magic moment you know i wish everybody the best of that because you know it's um it's there i have got a, a, another question i want to ask you um you've obviously got a phenomenal amount of bits and bobs from all over the place yeah yeah and i'm sure your current housing manager wouldn't allow the entire house to be ruled by <laughs> Fines from the foreshore, let's say. So, 
what what why where do you actually store stroke show your finds well it's, you know you know a man cave don't you dave yeah you say well i'm allowed a man cave you see <laughs> you've got a man house i've got a room for man cave you see i've got a whole room <laughs> near enough yeah well two two separate rooms yeah so um i get whatever you know pottery shirts i don't normally bother too much with but if it, it the better stuff like the roman pots and the um yeah bottles and other bits and bobs yeah they're the the high priority stuff is the stuff that normally gets out on display yeah so yeah same and wear and things like that yeah but pot shirts you know small bits yeah just box up and label them and date them and record them and, mm. and things and um keep those in a nice cardboard box nice and safe so, so uh, do you yeah. deal with your local finds Leo as an officer or do you deal directly with um a, a museum or, or archaeological yeah I, I, I deal with a chem one chem mm. finds as an officer Every, everything i get gets recorded so so what you're saying is that if you're a metal detectorist in kent the reason the so far is behind is because of you <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, could well be. Yeah. Could well be. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but he's, he is my fault, probably. Yeah, yeah. And all the archaeological site stuff. <laughs> Talk, talking of finds liaison officers. Working for you. <laughs> <laughs> talking of find liaison officers. Now, I haven't watched the uh, finders keepers. It, it just it wasn't going to throw me about. And then obviously, people's feedback wasn't the best. But uh, Mrs. Sadler's been watching it. And I caught part of last night's episode. And I don't honestly think the Portable Antiquity Scheme are going to be very happy with the uh, the programme at all. <laughs> well, um, after last night's um, ineptitude and chastising of, the, of the, yeah. the manner of which they spoke about metal detectorists and such like, and they, I don't think they're going to be best pleased. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think they're not always the easiest people to deal with, to be fair, because, you know, when you do find stuff, you, you know, the golden rule is, is to record it, isn't it? You know, yeah. kind of like, you know, if you've got rare stuff or unusual or, but, you know, it's, it's trying to get old some people can uh, be a bit of a bit of a nightmare sometimes. So, um, but yeah, yeah, but um at some point I, i'm sure they weren't very gracious with the dealings as uh the the fine liaison officer last night and it was a bit of a i only caught that and i was like oh, someone's not going to be very happy yeah yeah and i think i'm waiting for stuff to come back about a year and a half i think ago so uh yeah yeah i, I don't know, I don't know what and was, then I yesterday i think it was were the last year or the years before portable antiquity scheme um records were were produced uh, about all the things that have been found throughout the country and been recorded and classed as treasure as such like uh adrian wants to give mention to that last night but we'll probably if he's if he's back and good next week we'll we'll speak about that a little bit more then so uh yeah it's been it's, it's a very busy moment at the moment in the, the world of archaeology mm. and metal detecting and you know it's it's the it's the down months really isn't it yeah, yeah. You know, you you can't go. I think mudlarking really is the only thing that isn't going to be um, any any anything's going to come between you and mudlarking. You know, you can come between a detectorist with the weather. You can come between an archaeologist with the weather, but you yeah, can't go out yeah. and have a look on the foreshore. Yeah, that's it on the foreshore. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I think we've all been through those rainy, horrible days, haven't we, Dave? Where we got completely soaked, got stuck in a field somewhere. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Thinking just why? And you see these big black clouds coming over, and you just ignore them and think, no, no, it's all right, it'll pass over. And you end up absolutely getting drenched, right? Yeah, but uh, fun of it, isn't it? And then we've all been over the trench when got completely and utterly <laughs> turned purple. <laughs> And then black at the back of your head from the sunburn that you haven't realised is ripping you apart at the back. Yeah, of your head. I know that's another thing. Yeah, yeah. You start suffering from sunstroke. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Or trying to get a um, an animal like a cow out of the way, or trying to get past it, and they just won't let you past. It's quite a, quite a difficult thing sometimes. <laughs> and have you ever found on an archaeological site that chickens are actually the best that the archaeologists have? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> You hear that scraping rock. on the ground, getting rid. Oh, let's look for our food. Yeah, and some of the things that they're yeah. pulling up is absolutely amazing. 
Well, that's all right. How many how many badgers and rabbits find archaeological finds, aren't they? Yeah. yeah. And yeah. any mole hole, anything like that. Yeah. I always check for fragments of pottery and such like. In fact, when we went metal detecting, oh, I went metal detecting this weekend, just gone. There you go. Um oh, there was multiple mole hills and stuff, and there was lots of bits of pottery in, and hey, we were all having medieval finds as well, which was nice. <laughs> That's nice. Oh, nice. Yeah. Well, I'm going to have to sort out metal detecting day with you, Dave, at some point, one day in the future, won't we? Well, if not with me, Adrian's only just down in Essex. And yeah. as the crow flies, it's not that far. And I'm sure he'll be happy to accommodate. In fact, if uh, Eagle Eye DJI's there, yeah, right, definitely. in the chat room, he'll be there as well. And I'm, I've told Adrian I'm doing some road trips. So absolutely not a problem. Yeah, fantastic. No, no, enjoy it. Be lovely. Yeah, definitely. And I'll take you on the foreshore as well. We'll go somewhere and do a bit of a... Uh, oh, I'll tell you what. If, if I was to find uh, even just a pipe bowl, I, I'd be absolutely orgasmic. It would be phenomenal just to actually pull something out the the foreshore that's recognisable and yeah, old. Yeah. yeah. Oh, you'll love it. What, what's, your old, what's your oldest foreshore? Fine then. Like nothing it. really, honestly. Oh, nothing. Really? Okay. Nothing. Okay. okay. Pottery, which oh, this should be quite easy, here, really. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. I've got I've got a choice on this one. <laughs> to, to be to be fair, it probably beats any of me. Metal detective. Oh, well. just... <laughs> <laughs> and then I come along and find a five thousand year old camel. Yeah, that's it. There. Yeah. I'll go interview you next if you do that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'd only be doing it to get on meet Mrs. Roberts. That'll be all right with me. <laughs> I'll tell you what, it's but actually going back to that thing for Britain, it was a you know it fantastic experience. It was I mean, we done it was nine hours of filming overall. Mm. And five again, there was um you know the, the time on the foreshore was a baking hot day and it was um you know a few hours on there and it was but it, it was great you know it's fantastic and uh yeah it's uh you know when you when you see a program how it's run behind the scenes you know sometimes um it, it's so different as well it, it's amazing like, all the cameras and all the computers and everything it's just uh, phenomenal yeah 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 it's, it's yeah especially it's a special moment yeah i think and and you know it's there for you for life. It's there for your family. It's there for your future generations of the Tomlinsons to actually look back and say, "There's great great granddad Tomlinson on the bloody telly there." Yeah, He's documented I, now. I don't know what I'm going to look like as a great great granddad, mind you. I might probably lose all my hair. <laughs> <and everything. laughs> yeah, might have a few more wrinkles come up by then. <laughs> yeah, I think. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I think anything that opens up history is um you know for anyone who finds anything special you know it opens up history and it opens it up for future generations doesn't it and i think this is what's so important isn't it i mean you know people who you know find roman hordes or you know metal detecting fires which just open up that we find that we just do not know about uh, and i think it's um and i think that's the beauty of it and i think that is you know so important people can take over from there can't they down the line we you know when we're gone in time you know they can uh, and see what you know see these finds and uh yeah uh, and i think it's great yeah well <clears throat> i can't say anything else other than congratulations it's you know it's it's a pleasure seeing all the things that you're pulling out uh, thanks and, um, and obviously you know the digging for britain it's it's well recognized now as probably the leading program regarding archaeology following and i know time teams on youtube but obviously a lot of people still haven't tuned into youtube they're still yeah. waiting for it to come on telly so it's probably the leading program of its type now so you know yeah, yeah. We've made it there so yeah steve it's as ever it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show uh Thank love you very speaking much, to you i mean tonight again an hour and a half and it's gone it's gone like in an instant. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's been fantastic. I've missed me right hand man as ever. Uh, so, Adrian, get well soon. And Shane, get well soon. Um, yeah, and next week, currently, we haven't got a guest lined up. I don't think. I'm not sure. Don't think so. 
We do have Donna Martin in two weeks, who's asked me to ask her about the skull that she found metal when in the field. I don't know if it was metal detecting. I think it was human. Ooh. Ooh. That'll be interesting. Interesting one, yeah, yeah. Isn't it? Isn't it? She's an archaeologist as well. Metal detecting okay, excellent. So yeah, it's great, know. great guest to look forward to. Lovely. Plus, she's as mad as a box of frogs. Brilliant. We hear, <laughs> we hear our answer phone messages. <laughs> Steve, thanks for joining us again. Thanks and, very much, uh, Dave. We'll speak it's to you soon. Pleasure. Keep in touch, obviously. And we'll uh, do. I'll, I'll make that road trip. So, uh, yeah, it'll be lovely. Lovely to see you. It will be. Yeah. Well, that's make it a weekend. Yeah. Obviously, well, at least, <laughs> yeah. On a skill night. I mean, can't yeah. come down on a skill night. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, right, uh, everyone. Sorry. Lovely, brilliant. You take yeah. care anyway, Steve. And Thanks, thank Dave. you, Thanks everybody. So Cheers. If you're everyone. all out this week, good luck detecting. If you're not, good luck sat in the house. Have a good week, everybody. Good night. Night. Come on. <laughs>